Hello, Gaston County. Welcome to episode number 32 of Gaston's Great, a podcast highlighting some of the great things happening in and around Gaston County. I'm your host, Stephen Long, and we are coming to you once again from the international headquarters of GSM Services right here in downtown Gastonia, and looking forward to having some great discussions in the coming weeks and month, month or months. We simply believe in discussing more of the reasons why Gaston's great. We are highlighting another great organization this week and have Kim Willer and Jenny Moran from Crisis Assistance Ministry with us today. Kim is the executive director and Jenny, Jenny is both the volunteer coordinator and the finance administrator. I also heard she sweeps out the place occasionally. Uh, Kim and Jenny, it's great to have you on and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're, we're trying not to waste any time. We're going to get right to it and then maybe Kim start with you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself or anything you feel like you uh, want to share. Okay. I am um, from Gastonia. Grew up here. Graduated from Hunter Huss. Um, went off to school at UNC Wilmington thinking I was going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> um, studied business and economics there and ended up transferring to Belmont Abbey and um, got a degree in sociology. And then... Um, I have been at CAM since I started volunteering in 1991. Oh, wow. And went to work there in 1994. Um, I'm married. My husband is also from Gastonia, a little bit older than I am, but also a Hunter Hunter House graduate. Um, he um, works for Mercedes at North Lake. So we're, we're very embedded here in our community and want to – you know, we've always worked to make sure our community is a good place to be. I have three kids. Um, they're all essentially adults now. <laughs> um, two of them are still at home, mainly because of pandemic reasons. Yep. Um, I have a daughter who lives in Raleigh, and she and my son-in-law both graduated from Carolina and stayed in that area. And then my middle daughter graduated from Clemson in 2020. Oh, wow. So, and she's here now working for the Gaston County Sheriff's Office. Oh, very good. So, um, and my son, he's still trying to decide what he's going to be. So, it, but he's 21. So, all, all my kids are grown. I have three dogs that, two of which are mine, and one is a 104-pound lab that belongs to my daughter that our house is not near big enough for. That's a large dog. It is a large dog. He's, <laughs> and, and he's a lab. So, you know, and one of them is a six, six month old, um, golden doodle puppy. And he, he's a handful. So, you know, he's about as big as the lab now, just doesn't weigh as much. So you have five kids at home. So exactly, exactly. So, um, that, that's, that's about it for me. All right. Thank you, Kim. Jenny, what about you? <clears throat> um, I am a, Gastonia by association, native. Nice. Um, my husband grew up here and went to Ashbrook. So so Kim and I are rivals a lot. Um, state, Carolina, Clemson, Georgia. Um, we don't talk football season <laughs> usually. Um, but uh, so my husband, my husband grew up here. We've lived here since 2007. Um, took a short sabbatical to Georgia for a couple of years and came back. And um, I... Started working at CAM kind of when we came back in 2017, and I have three children as well. I have, they do, they just keep coming back. They come back and they come back. And, um, but two, one is a graduate of University of Georgia, the other's at uh, UNC Charlotte right now, and we are eagerly awaiting college decisions for my senior right now. Oh, wow. So, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, myself, um, graduated from NC State. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I graduated um, okay. twice. I loved it so much. I graduated twice from NC State um, and a degree in communication with an emphasis on marketing and a Spanish degree. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Very good. Did you say you went to NC State? Just to I did. That? I okay. did. Four and a half so. years of sheer bliss. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Kim kind of shared how she ended up at, at Crisis Assistance Ministry. Uh, Jenny, do you mind sharing how you got there? Um, sure, sure. I actually stayed home with my children for, for several years. Um, and, uh, when, when actually we lived in Georgia, I worked, volunteered at a food pantry through our church. And so I had known about Cam prior to us, uh, living here when we lived here the first time. Um, and so when I came back, the job was posted and I was like, that might be a good forte back in the, uh, in the working world. So, um, 
So that's kind of what prompted me. I have a heart for just helping others. So it was very appealing to me. Okay, very good. Yeah. So I did spend a couple minutes on the website uh, to do a little research. And I think if I read that correctly, maybe Kim, you can, I don't think this is one of the questions we sent you, but can you share maybe a little bit of the history of the organization? If I remember correctly, it was maybe started in 1976. Is that correct? By a few churches or? By, it was essentially the downtown churches. Right. Um, there were people that would just show up at the church needing mm-hmm. assistance because there wasn't a, an organized effort. And so some some volunteers got together. And, um, in fact, one of them is still a volunteer oh, really? for us. And um, so they got together to, to help the churches vet situations and make sure, you know, that there was somebody providing assistance. And that, that led to how CAM became um, what we are today, which we're supported by 44 congregations and the Jewish synagogue. Yeah, I saw the list on the website, and it was too many to read. Yeah, so that's actually that's right. encouraging, really. It's encouraging it, it to hear really that much support. It, it really is because, um, you know, we're, we're a cooperative ministry of all the, the faith community. And so we work with lots of different congregations, and they refer people. And if somebody shows up at a church and needs assistance, then they can refer them to us, and they know that that we'll be there to help. Yeah, I had to plug. Um, I don't think I've done this on any of the podcasts yet, but plug our church. I think Jenny and my church mm-hmm. is First mm-hmm. Methodist Church. Right. So I think Huge they were one of the supporter. one of the original they were. Um, churches that supported. But again, it, yes. it, it was it was nice to read. I mean, I knew a little bit about how the organization started just from my association with, with First Methodist, but I didn't grasp how many um, faith organizations are, are supporting right. uh, supporting CAM. So um, that was really nice to, to see. So uh, maybe, Kim, stay with you. What can you tell the listeners? What, what is the mission of CAM? Is there something specific, or what is it that you're trying to, to accomplish? We, we are there. Like I said, we're a... Uh, um, uh, cooperative ministry of all the faith community to help people out of a financial crisis. Um, We also take into consideration those who are um, living in poverty and really can't better their situation. So our our primary goal is to help people out of an immediate crisis. So we help with rent, utilities, and we have an on-site food pantry that um, we can talk a little bit about later. But Primarily, we started out just to keep people, to make sure they had the basic necessities of life. And over the years, we've evolved to where we um, work to make sure we refer them to other organizations that might be able to help their situations. We work to make sure we, we help in the greater Gastonia area, which right. turns out to be about half of Gaston County. And... Um, each town in Gaston County has its own little helping agency. Right. So CAM is by far the largest. Um, so we help to make sure that people have the resources that they need if they apply at our agency and we can't help them, we send them to who can help them. If they apply and it's not a service that we offer, we find out who can help them. And so that, that's basically what we do and what our mission is. Now, that's a great point because I'm I'm fortunate I'm on the board uh, United Way board actually I'm the current chairperson today is what December fifteenth for another two weeks I'm the chair you know, um, but I'm exposed to the other organizations around the county that 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 provide similar ser- services so I, I appreciate you you sharing that, um, maybe Jenny start with you in this next question. Can you talk about, and this is going to be for both of you, but can you talk about some of the, I'm not sure what you would call them, initiatives or programs or some of the specific things that, that you guys are doing week to week or month to month sure, for the sure. community? I think Kim, Kim will probably talk more about COVID and some of those initiatives. Um, I think one of our big initiatives right now is um, revamping our computer, our customer database, essentially okay. our client database. Right. Um, and we have partnered with a group in Charlotte called Aparo, helped us. They support non t- um, nonprofits through IT pro like needs. Okay. And through them with Duke Energy, we picked a solution, a database solution for us, and we are getting ready to kick that off into January with another um, partner through Aparo who will help us um, program that, alter it, you know, format it to our needs. 
I would say that's probably our, our biggest initiative we have going on right, right now. Um, so how, how is that, what's that going to do for the organization? How is that going to improve the operations or help serve the community? Or is that a fair question? It is. It is. Yeah, yeah. Part, part of what happened when, what, what we say when the world ended last March. Yeah. Um, we try to avoid that word we, on the podcast, but we, we all know <laughs> what you're talking about. We had to, we had to revamp the way we did things. Sure. Because we, and so our office was closed. We still needed to be there to help people. Um, we don't have an IT department. I sure. guess I should have talked a little bit about, we have a staff of four administrative people, okay. including Jenny and myself, and then we have two client services people, and then we have a food pantry coordinator and a food pantry assistant. So um, we, we are very small staffed. We do not have an IT department. Um, when everything closed down, Jenny and I worked to, and I will, I will totally give Jenny credit for most of it, um, we had to figure out how to help people and not see them in person. <laughs> so That's um, a unique dynamic. So <laughs> right. we, we did, we got some help with our website and hired someone to do that. But then we came up with an application um, process and a way for people to submit information. But it's very tedious. Sure. Um, because you, you apply on our website and then you have to email information. And a lot of our clients are not very tech savvy. And, and I would include myself in that. I mean, I've learned a lot. Sure. That can be intimidating if you don't I, do it. I have every learned, day. learned a great deal. And um, our current system just wasn't adaptable. So <clears throat> that's, that's why we went with the, to try to get a new database, but it'll improve our customer relations, I guess, or client relations, because they'll be able to apply and submit their information all through one source, whereas we won't search for somebody named John Doe that applied, but he used Jane Doe's email. And or Jane Smith's email, and you're you're trying to figure out who that is, and it, right. it gets pretty complicated. And we want to make it easy on our clients to access our services, as well as easier on our staff to be able to provide services. So that that was um, that's a pretty big deal for us. That um, is it fair to say? So you you both had mentioned the application process. So I'm assuming that means. Everybody just walks up to the door. Is it going to be provided services? So how do how do you? I don't like this phrase, weed it out, or how do you decide who? Uh, what kind of criteria are there? Uh, or am I, am I describing that correctly? Right. Well, primarily you have to have a financial crisis. Okay. You, a you have to live in Gastonia, the greater Gastonia area. Right. But um, you know, for us to be able to pay rent and pay utilities, we have to have documentation. We we have to be show that we're good good stewards of our resources so um and and be able to show people what sure, we've the, done with, right. with our um, financial resources yeah, I mean, donors and people like united way what, I, what i'm dealing with we, we we like to know that it's being it's done um, in a correct way. correct yep. so um what we do now if it's for if it's for food all you have to do is call the number and we'll get your information the the basic information we have to have for second harvest and because we are a second harvest agency and okay. receive food from them. And we'll get your information and then arrange a time for you to come pick up the food. And that's really the only thing we do in the office, you know, where we see people. And um, for rent and utilities, they submit the application online, and then we have to have a late rent notice. That That's one of the things we have to be really careful about, um, knowing who we're paying. Understood, yep. You know, if somebody applies and it's really their friend, Bob, that they put down as their landlord, and, you know, <laughs> and, and unfortunately that does happen. So we, we have to be careful about that and make sure that, and at the end of the year we have to submit, you know, 1099 documents to individual landlords. So we have to have some information regarding that. For utility bills, we have to have a disconnect note. But what we do is after they submit their information, we call. And um, we have a few volunteers. When but Before COVID, we had about 130 volunteers every, every month. 
Oh, wow. Um, we're down to about 20. 20. So a most, significant difference. Yes. Our, our volunteer pool, they, they were all in the extreme high-risk category. Oh, wow. Okay. And, I mean, okay. because they're all retired. Some Makes of sense. them, yeah. when I say some of them were elderly, we had somebody who was 99 that volunteered. Holy moly. So, you know, they we, we couldn't have them there to protect them. So um, we had to figure out a way, but we have some volunteers that come and they call and interview people and just talk about what their crisis is, what, what caused your financial crisis. And, um, you know, we try to take into consideration people that haven't been able to work because, you know, the sure. kids were out of school or, you know, so we, we've kind of relaxed things. Last year um, we did 259000 and client assistance, direct client assistance, as opposed to about 145 from the year before. So we we <laughs> kind of ramped up, and you know, it, it's it, I'm not going to lie, it's about 170 it's been, percent it's, or something yeah, increase. That's, been, that's dramatic. It, it was it was very dramatic, and you know that goes back to our partnerships with the community. The Rotary um, yep. did a drive for us. They did two food drives, um, but. And I, I might have gotten off topic. No, no, you're right. No, you're still good. No. Is it fair? Um, am I right? And you can correct me because, again, I'll, I say things all the time on these podcasts. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But uh, are you paying, like, the city of Gastonia is who you're paying? Yes. We, the, to, directly to the utility the, company or whomever it is instead of to the the individual. Right. Thing. Correct. Yeah. And with the pri- primarily the city of Gastonia is right. the biggest utility company we pay. Um, we do have some Duke Energy, some Rutherford Electric, um, Dominion. We do sure. help with gas bills, but um, I just did. I did a little bit of research earlier this year, and since two thousand, we've paid the city of Gastonia one point four million dollars on behalf of our clients. Okay, make so, sure you might want to repeat that number for our okay. listeners. That's a one, big number. One point four million dollars, and that just goes back to two thousand. Okay. Prior to that, we had a different accounting system, so I didn't <laughs> dig further than that. But um, that that's pri- primarily who we pay. This is good. I think there's a perception that CAM is a food pantry with a lot of pe- a lot of our citizens for some reason. Of course, I know since I've been so involved in the community, I've obviously right. discovered otherwise. But I think before, I think that's what I thought it was. You know? right. And I think right. especially the, the drive back and forth between our two buildings here, and I go by there multiple times a week. Um, so I, I think that's a, so I appreciate you sharing kind of that broader, it's, it's much more than just a food pantry. And I think a lot of times if you're just in your congregation at church, you know, First Methodist does food drives for us. Sure. Lots of our congregations do food drives. And I don't know that they really talk much about the financial aspect right. of what we do. And so um, that that is, I mean, I, I would say it's probably 50-50. I mean, okay. as far as food and financial. And and sometimes if we help somebody with food, that alleviates their crisis so they can pay their own utility <laughs> bill. Right. And sometimes vice versa. You know, we might have somebody that we interview for a utility bill that in the course of the conversation we see they also need food. Right. So we'll, we'll you know, say, do you do yeah, you I guess we want, we want to avoid having um, – Individuals having to decide between one or the other, right? Right. Week to right. week, and, and that, can, that can happen, right? Or month to thing. month, I mean. Yeah. And, and that's it. Like, one one of our other programs that we do is called our Hunger Prevention Program. Okay. And we started it probably in the early 90s, I think. And it's for, we call it our elderly food program, but it's just really you have to be 61 and older and on a fixed income. And those folks do not receive the... Um, amount of food stamps that some of our families receive. Okay. And um, we found that they were really struggling with food. So we created this program that they can come and pick up food once a month. We don't do an interview, which now it's kind of the same with everyone. But um, it was really beneficial prior to us being closed to the public because they didn't have to, they didn't have to go through the process every month, which, which could be tedious. You know, if we were super busy, then you might have to wait to, to get food. Right. And um, now they were just able to come in, and we had their information. 
And then we would just touch base about once every six months to verify everything was the same. And so, I mean, it was really beneficial for them. But, um, again, it you just kind of have to look around and see what's going on and see who really who who really is in need. Yeah, I've learned with my association with, say, United Way Community Foundation mm-hmm. that the um, – the senior population is one that can get missed right. on, on some of their needs. In fact, that's why the Christmas wishes program with United Way, we converted it this year to the senior Christmas mm-hmm. wishes. Now, part of that was funding issues due to COVID, right. but that is a, that is a, again, a segment of the population that sometimes doesn't have as easy access to some services and help that others might. And so I think, I think, Two years ago, Parkdale actually adopted our say. hunger prevention program okay. for the holidays, and that was really very moving and very impactful, I think, for our seniors. They went out and they shopped for our seniors. They were able to provide a little list of what they might want. Um, a lot of robes, a lot of slippers, a lot of socks um, were requested, but Parkdale brought those gifts to them as well as uh, holiday meal, which was really, that was cool. Oh, well, good cool for thing. them. That's terrific to hear. So I like this next question. I don't know if you, you know, I'll start maybe with you, Jenny, or either one of this is for both of you, but do you have any, without sharing specific names, obviously, uh, a story or a ex- specific example where a family or individual was helped that kind of really you know, struck a chord with you or something that you can recall? I mean, I think, I think certainly, um, each, each person in our office, each of our staff and volunteers bring their own life experience. Sure. So sometimes those stories hit one of us more than the other. Right. Kind of touches our heart a little bit more. Um, but I would say we've had one, two that maybe stick out to me is we've got a woman who is um, the grandmother in the, in the family. Her daughter receives dialysis several times a week. Um, the grandmother works third shift and she so she can be home to help take care of the grandkids while her daughter is in treatment Um, so this is a person who's definitely trying to work and support themselves and um, but just because of a medical condition uh, that it's 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 a cycle for them and it's a challenging cycle um, that we have been able to help several times um, she is extremely, extremely grateful. Oh yeah! Every time, yeah. always sends us a sweet thank you note. Every <laughs> time she gets um, assistance from us, so I think that's a really um, okay. That's, that's good. That's a really good one. Did I take yours? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, there there are really just so many. I'm sure uh, that I I don't know that I have one particular story that sticks out. Again, it, it was it was very moving that when when Parkdale came and gave gifts to our seniors, because a lot of those folks are people that we do know really well. Right. Because we see them on a monthly basis. And we know their situation's a little bit better than just somebody who may apply once a year. Right. And, um, you know, to be able to help our seniors, and, um, and we really try to – Try to make sure if they don't have a ride, we figure out a way, you know, make suggestions. How, who can come and get this for you? Um, we, we had somebody who was in that program for years and years and years, and she just stopped coming one day. She was actually had a Jamaican accent, and um, she was a character. <laughs> but, and she always brought us gifts every Christmas. I mean, just whether it was pecans from her yard or – and um, we, we tried – to track her down, and we think maybe she moved to England to live with her her children. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, people like that stick out in my mind okay. that that really we got to know. And we, we don't, and it's probably a good thing that we don't often know a lot more about some of our situations. But um, the, the ones we do, I, I'm glad we're there. I'm sure it would be very easy just to get attached to. Yes. Their it individuals is. Yeah. And, their, and, and their stories and and we do that too so sure. i mean sometimes we It'd be impossible we do that. not to i would think yes but um we 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 try to you know again when you hear stories all day every day it sometimes it's hard so so um if i heard you correctly this next question i'll start with you kim is is if i heard correctly at the beginning 
this is 30 years in with your association with CAM? It is. 1991? It is. I, I started volunteering when I was at Belmont Abbey <laughs> because my grandparents were involved. Okay. Um, I grew up at West Avenue and knew about CAM my whole life. My grandparents volunteered. And um, so when I graduated, I, they had a job opening, and I applied for it. Okay. Very and, good. Um, actually, um, George Miller, Dr. Miller. Oh, yeah. I've and Kathy were Miller. the ones that, that interviewed me. And George was a longtime volunteer. <laughs> Loved Dr. Miller. Yeah. H- him and his wife. But um, so, and I worked there until, until my son was born in 2000. And then I would have had to get another job to afford daycare to continue working. Uh, I understand. So yeah. I left for a few years okay. and then came back in 2006. Well, since 91 or uh, with your combined time there, is there something that stands out that maybe you can share that you're most proud of accomplishing or that you've seen happen with the organization? Well, I think, I mean, Jenny and I talked about this a little bit. I think <laughs> it really the last 18 months of our life, okay. the fact that we were able to adapt and and figure out a way to still do what we needed to do and to still be there for our community and um I don't know if you know, but we have now purchased the, it was the Phoenix building. Yeah. Um, it's not, it It looks like one building. The buildings were not connected. Right. Um, so we have purchased that building and have outfitted that as our new food pantry. It's more of a warehouse mm-hmm. space, which if you were ever at Phoenix, you probably wouldn't recognize it because now it's just, a big open space. Right. We, we connected the buildings with a ramp. Um, we we did get right before um, uh, 2020, we got a walk-in refrigerator and freezer. Got grants okay. through the Community Foundation and some other folks and um, the Glenn Foundation. Mm-hmm. And um, so we had to connect the buildings so we could still use that. But I think that's going to be a really good opportunity, and we're hoping to – eventually have kind of a free a free little pantry slash store okay. for people to come in and pick out their own produce and me we our food pantry is extremely well stocked I would say yes and a variety of food it's the same food you'd get at the grocery store right we pick up at food line four days a week we pick up at Panera one day a week hmm. um, three fish which does the frozen crab cakes, shrimp, all kinds of stuff. Um, they bring us their excess um, probably once or twice. Uh, every six weeks. Yeah, about weeks. every six weeks. And so we're able to give that out. Oh, well, that's so good. people get the crab cakes that you get at Harris Teeter. So, um, it's, a, it's, not, it's not just ramen noodles. Right. It's Correct. not just ramen noodles. Yeah, and that's good. That's yeah. good. So, but um, we do get so, – and we also have pick up at the Rotary Garden – during the um, spring and summer months. So we want to be able to let people come in and pick out some of their own food. Right. And, um, you know, some people would prefer fresh (laughs) and some people wouldn't. So we, you know, we want to, above all, make sure we don't waste anything. And, you know, just have that available to people, even if they're just in the Highland area and want to come by. So we hope by by this summer maybe... That'll be up and running. Well, that's interesting about the other side of the building because when I was working out in the field years ago, that was actually a an HVAC refrigeration distribution company that that was okay. in that in that uh, in that side of the building. Um, Jenny, what about you? Would was, was that did she steal your answer on on what maybe what you're most proud of accomplishing? I think. Well, certainly. I mean, I think sur- surviving the last eighteen months. Is, <laughs> And it sounds like in serving more people, serving more people with, with at the fewer, same at the same time with fewer volunteers and staff. Right. I mean, to say it was a challenge is, um, and and you know, it's kind of like we're on the other side. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. I think, especially the first six to eight weeks in terms of food. Um, you know, that was that was a, a big need for us. So yeah, I would definitely say that's um something we're proud of. Additionally, I would say increasing our volunteer. I know we just talked about not having volunteers, but we've also kind of expanded our volunteer program a little bit in the last four years um, where we are trying to get more groups engaged. 
Um, definitely more people from the community engaged. And by that, I mean we've gotten some schools involved. Like First which, Methodist Youth have been out there, haven't they? Right. And I okay. I mean, that's kind of a, one of the things that Kim and I have talked about is getting more youth involved. Sure. I think that's important to, to let them start serving young. Um, yeah, I know it impacted Rachel the time she's been out there. Yeah, so we, we have several youth groups that have come. We have um, Horseshoe Cross Country came, which I oh, would love. Right. I would that's love right. to see more sports teams come. I think, again, I think that's impactful for youth sure. to kind of move beyond themselves a little bit. In fact, the last time I think was the cross country team, not the first method. Both. The last time Ra- that she, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel was came there. both. Okay, um, very good. She did. And, Whew, that's um, good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we've had teens changing Gaston County recently. Gaston Early College has come. So uh, that's... In fact, she might have been there for teen changing Gaston County, too. She 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 might have been. Yeah, I think she was, actually. <laughs> She's been a busy girl I'll there. Give her... Well, i got to give her, her and her mother credit for that. I'm but, just... In the background the, on that, the mayor's um, youth council. Yeah. No, yeah. the ma- no, the um, young adults of young adults. Yeah, young adults of Gasson County. Um, a lot of Rotary, different Rotary groups have come and served. So um, that was kind of a mission for Kim and I is to expand okay. those hours, um, which was is somewhat limiting in terms of who can volunteer. So we have expanded our um, opportunity. Actually, we had Bel Air Nursing. So their staff came yesterday and volunteered, and um, American and Eford has come, A and E has come, oh, that's and great. volunteered during the day. So those those programs and exposing people to what actually goes on, sure, um, has I think that's been pretty cool too. Well, Kim, kind of go back to you. What what do you envision the organization looking like five to ten years down the road? Well, I would like to say we would we weren't needed. The dream is but, to not be needed. Yep, I, I, I'm with um, you on that. But what I think what and what we've really been working towards in the past few years is not only just helping somebody with their immediate financial crisis, but again, referring them to organizations that might help them okay. and um, out, out with additional resources, I guess. Maybe know? more upstream type solutions right. as it, opposed to the crisis of Correct. Okay. So that maybe they don't have to come back to us and that <laughs> right. they don't need us. Um, we, If somebody has cancer, we refer them to cancer services. We work with um, Dwayne Burks with the Gateway yeah. um, because that organization, while they don't, they don't even have a brick and mortar building, they just, um, if somebody texts them and needs something, they know where to refer them. And I, I think that's a big need because a lot of people don't know where to go for certain things. So if we could get to the point where we can give people additional resources and avenues to help in the future, then, you know, maybe we can alleviate at least some <laughs> sure. of the need. Because that, I mean, that's our overall goal is to alleviate the need. Yeah, we started our a little late this year, our United Way campaign here at the company uh, this morning at our big company meeting. And, and there was a part of my presentation was about um, with COVID, which I don't like to talk about. The need is greater, but some of the resources are less during this, during this right. time period. Right. So it's, it's a very unique challenges, I guess, for, for charitable organizations and, and nonprofits. Um, so uh, Jenny, what about you? Would you, from a volunteer standpoint or kind of from your view, how do you, anything you would add to what, what Kim described? I, I think one of the other things that we, you know, in the back of our minds maybe, COVID, one of the things COVID has highlighted is the need in the Hispanic community. Okay. Um, I do have a degree in Spanish literature, which um, if you don't speak the language, I kind of forgot it for quite some time. Oh, sure. Um but since COVID has been back, I am, God bless those people, their translator. I can only speak in the present tense, which gets a little bit challenging sometimes for, <laughs> for them. But honestly, it's um, the, that the Hispanic population was very hard hit by COVID, given a lot of the jobs that they have, um, which were, you know, a lot of house cleaning, a lot of, a lot of in-home services sure. that that community provides. Um, that then all of a sudden people didn't want them in their homes. Right, you know, again, rightfully so during COVID, a little, little uncertainty, um, did not receive stimulus funds 
So that has been a, a community that has been hard hit, and there are not a lot of um, places to send them, quite honestly. So I would say um, we're slowly trying to get to a point where we can support them some more. Um, again, when we have somebody call and they can't speak English, I can only go so far with them. Right. Um, we, we have a couple of, uh, like a couple of friends, my daughter that speaks Spanish and one of our guests and early college kids that are bilingual that, you know, I'm calling them up going, Hey, can you help me? Um, you know, we would like something a little bit more structured, consistent (laughs) and structured. Yeah. Um, so that is, um, that I said, I think would probably be one of our, our, yeah, I've actually seen, my fact, we just had Steve Eaton at our, my rotary club last week and. You know, I saw some statistics that they were not only they were that community was hit harder as a percent um, with COVID cases as well, uh, a little sure. di- a little dis- sure. disproportionately to their um, you know their amount of uh, of p- p- people here in the community. So right. it's a it's an it's a kind of a double whammy there. So before we move on, this is for both of you. Is there anything I haven't asked about Cam that I should have? Anything else you'd like to share? Of course, you know we'll finish up with making sure. Our listeners know how to get in touch with Cam, how to support the group, volunteer, and we'll make sure we hit all that at the end. But anything else that you, you'd like to share before we move on to the really important questions? That's, I mean, I think we've hit the highlights. I think I y'all have been great. Yeah, I mean, y'all have covered a lot. You really have. You've done a terrific job. I, I think. I mean, I think we covered most of it. We are just. Um, I guess you've seen next door to us is the new transit right. center yeah. and the pretty new stadiums right behind us. And now Trenton Mill, and it's going to be all um, pretty. So we're, we're working to get our building spruced up a little bit, <laughs> just so you know. We didn't talk and about our, uh, our initiative we're proud of is, is Kim and I just go stand out in our right. newly paved parking lot sometimes and look at it and stare. Oh, that's nice, um, yeah. we, di- we did just get our parking lot repaved because, as, as we joke, we could have lost a small child in some of the potholes that were well, there. You know, they we were did that in the last couple of years at United Way uh, when I was in – Within the last six years, I've been on the board, and yeah, I, I have to admit, I would pull in the parking lot and just stop for a minute and look around. And it's, a, <laughs> well, it's amazing. It's, it makes a difference, doesn't it? It's Huge amazing difference. how <laughs> exciting a parking lot is. <laughs> I mean, I, ne- I never knew that I'd be so excited about that, but it is. It is. Yeah, so so we're, we're, we are looking for, um, I would yeah. say, some resources to maybe make Paint the building a little bit and prettier and some kay. landscaping landscaping and, and things like that but um yeah so all right so good a, we have some i'm sure we have some listeners who might have some be involved with landscaping or construction or um know somebody who does that stuff so if, if you're out there if cam could cam could use some help so we're going to shift gears and obviously we'll finish up with cam to make sure our listeners know how to how they can help but this is really what the listeners want to know about, especially your families and your um, the, the other staff at, at, at CAM. And today, you know, I change the name of this every week. So this is today's going to be the Ashbrook versus Hunter Huss speed round of questions. Oh. Okay. So we're going to start, uh, Kim, with you. What is your favorite Tony's ice cream flavor? Well, that would be chocolate. Chocolate. Very good. That's mine as well. I think I say this every time somebody says chocolate. I say, I'm, every time I go in there, I'm going to get something different, but not, I don't. I get the same thing every time. Jenny? Banana pudding. Banana pudding. Okay. I like it. We've had one person maybe say that or something similar. <laughs> All right, Jenny, sun drop or cheer wine? If I had, I don't really drink soda, so I'm going to, but if you, I you did. You still have to answer, by the way. If I did, su- sun drop ice cream. There's such a thing? Yeah, Tony's, Tony's made it, yeah. Oh, gosh, I didn't even know that. I'm a lifelong resident here, and I didn't. Quite delicious. Wow. I'm going to have to look into that. Kim? Cheer on. Cheer on. So y'all do fight. Um, (laughs) Kim, favorite local restaurant? Oh, I like all the downtown restaurants. Um, And and we, Pita Wheel, you know, Webb for a nice meal. Barrister's, their patio. Viva Taquis. I mean, we, we... frequent all of them yeah, it's quite a different than say 15 years ago isn't it oh yeah uh, very, very much so I and mean, if i had to i could even walk from here you know right. to, to very, just walk very down to nice to be able to go 
and we and we used to frequent Spindle City a lot. Yeah, so we were very sad. Yeah, I, 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 I did. I, I agree. I hated to hear that as well. I was just say I think I grew up in Raleigh, so I like to think of myself as the big city girl. So when we started coming here to Gastonia in the early '90s, I think it was the fish camps in Villa Roma, and it was yeah. it was it was a lot for me to take in. That there was not as many choices. Oh, and Hayden's, that's where we always would age. So. Hayden's oh, out Hayden's at Franklin yeah. Square, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So what What about you? What would you say is your favorite local restaurant, Jenny? I would go with String Bean, probably, I guess, in Belmont. Yep. String, String Bean's Bean. great, yeah. yeah. So as a Raleigh girl, are you a char grill person? Or are you? I'm not? disappointingly not. Um, I know, right? I'm a vegetarian, so it um, is not super appealing. So you and my too. daughter Hannah should hang should hang we out. We should, yes. but my my son is a char girl. Oh yeah, I'm a I'm all so. about, about some char girl. <laughs> I mean, that's almost one of those stops that I have to make. Uh, used to be used to be two guys was the place I had to go <sighs> two to. Two guys and yeah. brothers. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're all gone now. Yes. So here's my. Um, I'm sorry, I was going to skip a question. Uh, Jenny, favorite outdoor outdoor activity in Gaston County or favorite park or does does the Whitewater Center count? Because sure, I mean yeah. it's technically. I would say we we frequent the Whitewater Center quite, yeah, a, quite a bit, and okay. that's that's quite I, that's would be super unique favorite. for our area, right? So Very one, unique. one of a kind place. Very impressive when you get to take somebody there, sure, and, and show it. Right, I, I would say Crowder's Mountain. Yeah, that's a popular I, I don't answer. Mention, I don't do a lot of of hiking these days. Sure, but I, I told you I grew up in West Avenue, and Easter morning. We'd climb up the mountain in the dark and do our sunrise service up yeah. there, and so those are those are nice memories. I think our youth still at First Mess still does it. Did they maybe it might be the Sunday closest to Easter. I think I Palm not, Sunday. Maybe. Uh, maybe it is Palm Sunday that they that they they still do that. So um, Kim, I'm gonna modify this question a little bit for today's episode, but uh, this is one of my questions that I you know, just because I can I can ask the questions. UNC Duke, NC State, or UNCW? Oh, UNC. I love UNCW, but uh, uh, UNC. Mm. I, I grew. I, I was, have to I say, was, I was hopeful that maybe. every everyone in my family went to Carolina, including my daughter. But my mom, dad, brother, sister. I was the black sheep of the family. That's unfortunate. So, or the um, smart one. Um, grew grew up loving UNC. So well, you know, I have a mixed. I have a mixed marriage, as I like to say. Is Janet and all of her, her both of her parents went to UNC, and she went to UNC, and then. Um, it's the, a beautiful the, place, and, and don't NC get State me wrong, I love Raleigh, and my best friend went to State, so I spent a lot of time at State during college, but always UNC. We're going to move on. Jenny, <laughs> UNC Duke or NC State? Go Pack. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> we might edit out Kim's answers to that um, as we move on here. So, Jenny, sticking with you, what is something very few people know about you? That I'm a vegetarian. I've been well, a vegetarian for about 30 years. Wow. So, that's a long time. Good um, good for you. Uh, makes me sad she doesn't get to go to the Angus Barn. I, uh, now, Angus uh, Barn I is mean, a is that, a primo location in, that, up that in the Raleigh area. <laughs> so. And I think, let's see what the other newest unique thing is that I am a dual citizen of Luxembourg, the country of Luxembourg. So. Really? I, really. I'm pretty sure that would be the only time anyone answers with that here probably i think yeah. probably you could have a pretty big radius before you're going to so, hit another one of us and unless this is like a hour-long answer how does that happen it happens from family uh, okay. my great 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 grandfather was uh, a resident of luxembourg before he came to the u.s in the 1800s and about 10 years ago the country of luxembourg decided that they had wrongfully terminated people's citizenship okay. when they came to the U.S. And so they created a pathway for um, those those families to regain their citizenship. Um, and the question many people are like, why? But that allows us, we're now citizens of the EU as well, which will okay. allow, really we did it for our children, that they can go live work in the in anywhere in the EU Europe. without visas or anything like that. Okay. So, yeah. Well, good. Well, that's, that's another that fun, is unique. <laughs> another fun fact, she was in Luxembourg when the pandemic when started. The pan- oh, wow. Yes. When the world shut down. That is a true down. statement. And when, and when they were said. Were there issues getting out? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and when, when, when they said, we're closing the borders, and they forgot to say, except for U.S. citizens, that was a little alarming to be over. Um, my husband and son were still here, and they were very excited about the prospect of me not coming home for a while. <laughs> I doubt that, but okay. <laughs> oh, my. So, Kim, uh, top that one on what is I something can't. very few people I, know I about really, you. I really can't top that one. I mean, I, I really have no – I mean, my thought was, you know, people probably – don't know that I like to watch Hallmark movies, even though they're sappy and silly. Uh, it's easy to watch and not have to worry. And you know what? Surprisingly, that you're not the first person to answer that. Okay. All um, right. Kim from Cancer Services. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. And, and um, I have to admit, um, this time of year with Janet Long at home, there is almost always a TV <laughs> on at any moment in the day with a Hallmark movie on. In fact, uh, I hope I don't lose some um, man points for this, but we watched we watched a Hallmark movie last night, or most of it, and you're right. You know what? You want to get away from all this right. wackiness going on, on, on in the world. You watch a Hallmark movie. If nothing else makes you feel better about, right. about the world. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's I actually, just... so I actually appreciate that answer. Oh, okay. Well, it still doesn't talk being a dual citizen. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it doesn't. Of Luxembourg that I can't even spell. So, uh, Kim, what about a book or um, anything you might recommend to our, any type of reading you might recommend to our listeners? Well, I mean, I don't know that it would be a great thing to recommend, but I'm currently reading the new Outlander book. Okay. And it's pretty awesome. But um, okay. no, I've also good. been, I've been reading the, um, which you'll love this answer, the um, Matt Darty Rebound. Um, who's Matt Darty? Uh-huh. And um, it, it's very interesting. I started out, actually, that, that was one of the first podcasts I had ever listened to. Cause oh, yeah? I just don't. But um, it was very interesting, him talking to all these different people who overcame and some some type of issue. Gotcha, yeah. And um, it, it it's very interesting to me. So to see how somebody can can really come back from something that, was not great. Well, so um, I, I'm a huge sports fan, so um, I believe just personally that it's almost impossible to follow in coaching. It's you know he didn't oh, sure. he didn't directly follow Dean Smith, but Dean Smith to Bill Guthridge, well. right. he may as well, well well have you know it's kind of following uh, Matt Darty, um, uh, Jim Valvano, you know whomever. It's just it's just very difficult to be the the, the next right. coach behind somebody like oh, that. Sure, so sure. Without, so it I is, actually can appreciate that. Yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, Jenny, what about you? Anything you could share? Books, TV, Does TV count. Sure. Ted Lasso. You know what? I'm embarrassed to say I have I have been Ted Lasso. Yeah, we don't even, we don't have Apple TV, and gosh, I'm probably going to get. It's worth the five dollars, but I but I have heard it nothing really but good is. things. And I'm involved with a group called F3, and mm-hmm. uh, it's a leadership group. But I mean, they've even talked about that on their podcast about the leadership principles and a lot of things that have come from it. Plus, it's funny and entertaining. It on is top you, of it. It you is could one re- of the best shows, and I'm a huge soccer fan. I've ever seen too, so. And you could regain some of your man points you lost for okay, the hallmark. Yeah, for the hallmark there comment. Well, we're going to move right along then. Um, so yeah, we, we're going to finish up here. Uh, with a few more questions, this has really been good. So uh, I'll start with you, Jenny. Remember, this is a podcast about Gaston County and why it's such a great place. So besides Cam, why would you why would you say Gaston is such a great place? Oh, uh, you know, we again, being from Raleigh, uh, we might have made fun of Gastonia a time or two, <laughs> um, but it's really the community. I mean, I love living here, and it's the community and. Um, Whenever somebody, family is here from Raleigh or friends are visiting and we go out, you just, you always see somebody you know. They're right. always friendly. They, you know, it's just, it's a very supportive community. Um, and I just think it's, um, people look out for each other. And um, our time in Georgia, we lived just outside of Atlanta. It was a large high school, 4,000 students. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's, and that is big. You know, you were just anonymous, um, and nobody, I didn't, you didn't feel like anybody was looking out, for, like, even when my kids still go out, I feel like there, somebody's looking out for them. Sure. You're always going to run into somebody. Um, I, I feel like if my kids started 
acting a fool, I would I would know fairly quickly. Yeah, some somebody they they will see somebody that knows their parents. Somewhere Correct. Um, <laughs> I I love the one degree of separation. Um, okay, that's good. Yeah. And that's terrific. Kim, how would you? What would you say to that question? Well, again, pretty much the same. Is it's our community. It's the fact that you know. When everything was super hard the last 18 months, people stepped up right. and gave extra and did extra food drives for CAM. And again, Gaston County has changed so much. It used to be if you wanted to go for a nice meal, you, you automatically assumed you were going to Charlotte. Right. Well, now you can go to Belmont, you can go to Mount Holly. Yeah. You have all these fun things to do in all our downtowns. Um, you know, we have the baseball stadium. My son worked there over the summer as an usher, which was a really good experience for him. Um, it was really fun. My, my parents lived here up until probably 20 years ago. I mean, my dad grew up here, but um, and they moved to Raleigh because of his job. But um, when they come back and I'm able to take them, you know, to downtown, like we went to Webb and then sure. we drove by, by the... Um, ballpark and you know for somebody that hadn't lived here but grew up here it's amazing to see yeah, that's a, if you've been here you haven't been here a long time but you grew up here and haven't been here a long time that is an astounding thing to see where it is it really is i mean it's so it, it's, it's it really, really a, is so it, it's just i mean it's a it's a good community to live in absolutely yeah i agree that's been a, a common theme so this is probably my favorite question um so kim i'll, I'll start with you looking back i know it's just a few years ago a couple years ago, looking back on your, or knowing what you know now, what, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Don't stress so much <laughs> about, the, about things. You know, take things in stride and don't, don't worry so much. Yeah, because when you're 20, things that seem such a big deal really aren't. Right, <laughs> right, and and that I mean I think that's probably good advice. Oh, absolutely for my life today. But, sure, right. But certainly, you know, you you got to take a step back and relax a little bit, and you know, not not sweat the small stuff. Yeah, I, I think I've learned looking back at my twenty year old self, the things I stressed about weren't a big deal. Now it's things that I mean, they might be a big deal, but they're out of my control, and the things right. that are out of my control, I still stress about, which is just right. It's hard. Is that the, the definition I mean, it really of insanity? It's probably. Hard. It, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. Jenny, what about you? How would you answer that question? Mm, well, 20-year-old self was living large at NC State, so. Uh, so was it, I. <laughs> it, it might be to just stay there. Uh, that might be my good advice. No, I think similar. I think work-life balance and really trying to, it's, it's such a cheesy saying, but to live in the moment. Sure. Um, I've, I've experienced a lot of loss recently and that just is something you try to practice so again try not to control the future um yeah i can be a little controlling person so that's hard on me but to not not try to plan out every detail of the future and just kind of live a little bit more in in today yeah i think um we've had so many that question it, it so many great answers and so many great discussions from it but the one that i go back to too is to your point is perspective and Unfortunately, I think it's impossible to really have perspective when you're 20. At least, you know, it takes so it takes experience and just time is almost the only way you can really do that. Or, or uh, same as you, you know, my family between our company here and our family, we've experienced some significant loss as well the last you know couple of years, and that and that really ramps up the perspective. It you know, does, and so so I greatly appreciate those answers. You know, well, this, is, um, this has really been good. So where can our listeners go to learn more about the organization, donate, volunteer? How, how, how can, what, how, what can we share with, with them? I would say our website is, is the best right. source of information. There is a button there about volunteering. Yep. Um, there's a, as well as email us, um, and our phone number is on the website. Um, and the best thing to do is to call. Uh, we love, yeah. like I said, we love working with groups and trying to engage those groups um, at this point. Um, yeah, it's a great web. I mean, I've been on it. I spent some time. It's a great website. It's really, I mean, it, it takes you exactly where you need to go, and it's it's very clear, and there's no questions about, you know, how to navigate it if you want to help, volunteer, donate, or whatever. Well, what about social? Is there any social media or, we, or no? We do post on Facebook. Um, okay. 
again, my, yes. my past history is in marketing. Um, so I, I dabble when we're not, <laughs> when we're not sweeping the building right, and sure. revamping our um, database. Um, we try to post somewhat on social media. Um, we do not have a large presence. We do not. Facebook, we sure, do not. That's fine. Um, no, but, but that yeah. also we get messages through Facebook. Right. Um, and a lot of people do call and simply, I think calling is still a great way. You know, people like to know what, what are your immediate food needs? Um, and we are always able to provide. Good. Um, right now that's jelly. We would need <laughs> jelly, <laughs> that's which is a weird thing to say, but that's interesting. we have a whole lot of peanut butter. And let's be honest, who really likes peanut butter without the jelly? Yeah, I mean. Probably not. Or chocolate to dip it in or something. Something. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the whole is, and that's, I, I appreciate that because the whole point of this is to bring awareness to your organization and, and maybe get more people to learn about it and be aware of it. And hopefully you, you'll get some volunteers, some help uh, from somewhere. Uh, somebody may be listening for the, and not, not be aware of your organization, not be familiar with it. So that's, that's kind of the whole point of what we're try, trying to accomplish here. So, ladies, uh, I appreciate your time. I'm going to kind of do my finish up like I do every week with my, my own book recommendation for the week and this has been recorded i guess a couple weeks or a week or so before christmas and i'm actually rereading this particular book and i probably read it for the first time 11 or 12 years ago it's called man's search for meaning by victor frankel and he was a psychiatrist who survived the um, couple of nazi concentration camps and it's a very interesting um, outlook he was actually a um he was kind of in psychiatry at the same time as Freud was, but he kind of went against some of Freud's teaching. That maybe that's why I like him. <laughs> but but if you want to learn about what it takes to survive something like that, it's really it's really a great a great read. Again, that's Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankel. And my quote for the week is coming from John Maxwell, who is who I consider and a lot of people consider maybe the the modern guru on leadership. And he has a great saying that sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. And it kind of goes maybe back to that question that the answers we hear a lot about the twenty year old self advice is take some of those experiences that seem so bad <laughs> when you're twenty and what can you learn from it? I know when I was twenty I wasn't learning anything from anything that went bad. Or at least I put it out of my mind as it was a disaster instead of trying to learn something from it. So but again, John Maxwell is somebody I would recommend you know, kind of following, looking into. He's got some great leadership. Uh, leaders, leadership uh, information in books. So again, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. So thanks for taking the time to listen to today's episode. Please spread the word if you can about the podcast, and please don't hesitate to contact us here at podcast at gastonsgreat.com. We haven't gotten any emails lately, have we? Somebody out there, please email us to make <laughs> so we know that you're there. And we're always looking for suggestions for future podcast topics and guests. You can find the podcast and subscribe at the website, gastonsgreat.com, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Please follow us on all our social media platforms. And apparently, giving us a good rating helps the podcast get noticed. So we need a lot of those five-star ratings, please. Thanks again to uh, Kim and Jenny from Crisis Assistance Ministry for being our guest today. Gaston's Great is produced and brought to you by Amy Anderson and Elizabeth King from GSM Services and edited here locally by the Sumner Group. I'm your host, Stephen Long. Thanks again for hanging out with us, and please keep coming back to hear more reasons why Gaston's great. <laughs>